Well, I had a totally different message lined up for today, but in light of all that's happened this week, we need to talk about trusting God in difficult times. How do we trust in God when there's so, so much grief and suffering and feeling overwhelmed with loss? Last Sunday, Kiowa was worshiping with us, and now he's with Jesus. And then Cheryl, very next day that Kyle had his heart attack, fell, silliest thing, fell off a ladder as she's taking down lights. And now she's not sure if she's ever going to be able to walk again or use her arms again. Her husband, Mike, already in hospice care. Jolene being in the hospital for many months. And her husband, Brian, facing surgery. And all of you have been there too, facing loss, difficult times, suffering, watching a loved one slowly passing away, going through physical ailments of your own, difficult times, and we ask the same question every time, don't we? We ask God, why? Why? Why am I going through this? Why is there so much pain? Why is there suffering? Where are you in all this, God? And so today we're going to look at the story of a man who had more grief than we could possibly imagine, a man named Job, familiar with pain and suffering. And our main verse is Job chapter 13, verse 15. I invite all of us to read it together. It says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Let's say that again. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even though I'm going through an awful situation and it seems like God might even kill me, I'm still going to trust him through it all. Place my hope in him. You've felt overwhelmed with tragedy before, and you've been submerged with suffering. And when that happens, it's wise for us to turn to someone who experienced suffering. And so we look at the, the life of Job. Now, Genesis was the very first book of the Bible, but did you know the earliest book of the Bible, perhaps to be written, was the book of Job? And it's as though God from the very beginning is saying, you're going to be facing suffering, and I want to give you a tool to help you in how to face it. So let's turn together to Job chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. This is a good man, a man of integrity. He wasn't perfect, but he was blameless and upright. He had a loving respect for God, and he strove to do the right thing. Verse 2 says he was very blessed. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. He was very blessed with wealth, with 10 children, and he had many flocks and herds and servants. Then we see what happens behind the curtain. Satan approaches God with a test, and he says, Satan, the accuser, says to God, no wonder Job loves you so much. You've blessed him with so much wealth. You've blessed him with a large family. But if you strike him, you, if you strike everything he has, he's going to curse you to his face, to your face. And the Lord said, okay, let's do this test. His Everything he has is in your hands, but you can't touch him. Now notice the Lord is in control, and he has Satan on a leash, but God allows this suffering to happen. Then in the same day, verse 13 tells us that Job 
lost all of his oxen and donkeys. They were all carried off and all of his servants killed who were tending to them. And only one servant is left. And as he's finishing talking, verse 16 says, another one came, another messenger says that fire came from God and burned up all your sheep and all those who were shepherds. And I'm the only one left. And like staccato, the very next person speaking comes up and he says, now all your camels have been killed by the sword and many of your servants killed by the sword. Actually, I'm the only one left. And then the worst news of all, verse 18, all your children were gathering at your oldest son's house and a wind came and knocked down the house and all 10 of your children are dead. Can you imagine the grief? All of your children dead like that just on the heels of hearing that all of your wealth is wiped out. The grief would be overwhelming. And verse 20 says, at this, Job got up and he tore his robe and he shaved his head, signs of mourning. Now, I don't know about you. The very first thing I, w I would do is, is probably not think about worshiping, but this is what we see Job does. But first what he does is he releases his grief to God. He tears his robe, he shaves his head, and this is what we need to do when we face suffering. We need to release our grief to God. Don't try to hold it in, don't try to be tough. Express your sadness. It's okay to cry. Do you know, do you remember what the shortest verse of the Bible is? Jesus wept. He's familiar with pain and suffering. A man of sorrows. Verse 20 says that Job knew how to deal with his grief. He gave it to God. Job released his grief to God in mourning. But what Job does next is pretty amazing. It's, it tells us that Job worshiped God. The rest of verse 20 says that he tore his robe, shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And again, I, I don't think that's the first response I, I would have. All my kids, gone. All my wealth, gone. And the first thing he says after he mourns is, God, I praise your name. He's a great example for us. When you're feeling overwhelmed, when tragedy strikes, worship God even in the pain. Even when you're going through the pain of loss, you can praise God. The Lord gave you everything that you have, all your wealth, your health, your family, your friends. Do you believe that? That the Lord has given you everything that you have, and he has the right to take it all away because he gave it all to us. Verse 22 says, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job didn't blame God. He didn't curse God. And so Satan says, that, doesn't, that didn't work, so he didn't curse you. But it's because he still has his health. If you strike his flesh and bone, he's going to curse you. And so God said, very well, go ahead. You can test him, but you have to spare his life. And so Satan afflicted his body with sores, with these boils from the tip of his toes to the top of his head. So much pain and suffering. So much so that... He took a, a piece of broken pottery and trying to relieve his pain, scraping the boils off, and he just sat in the ashes. His wife, Job, Job's wife was very encouraging, said, why don't you just curse God and die, you know? Why are you holding on to your integrity? Why are you, why are you still believing in God when he doesn't seem to give a rip about you? And Job says, you're talking like a foolish woman, a woman who doesn't know God. Should we expect good from God and not troubles? 
It's easy to praise God when everything's going right, isn't it? But what, what about when your world falls apart? What happens? Do we still praise God? Now look at what happens to unfortunate Job. He's suffering financially, emotionally, physically, and now he has three friends visit him. And in chapter 2, verse 12, it says when they saw Job, they could hardly recognize him because he was so, um, just had, had these sores all over, just sitting there, doesn't look like my friend anymore. And the friends did a, something great at first. They wept with him. They tore their clothes, sign of mourning with him. They sprinkled dust on their heads, and they sat with him. And it says they sat with him seven days and seven nights. And they didn't say a word because they saw how much he was grieving. As a side note, sometimes when a loved one is suffering, the best thing you can say is nothing at all just to be there, give him a hug, give him a, you know, a, a, a pat on the back. You don't have to say anything. Sometimes your presence is enough. And they were doing fine until they opened their mouth and then they, everything went downhill. And in chapter three, Job starts venting and he, sa- he doesn't curse God, but he curses the day that he was born. He says, God, wh- why did you ever let me live? Why don't I just why don't you just kill me? You've been there before. You just like, you you don't want to kill yourself, but you're just like, I'd be fine if you just, if I died. Perhaps you've been there before. And Job is at that point. There's so much grief. God, it's not fair. Why me? Why am I going through this? I just want to die. I can't take it. And then Job's friends start talking, which was their mistake. And they start trying to give him logical arguments of why they might be going through, he he might be going through all this. They're well-intended, sometimes theologically correct, but not very helpful. They start saying, maybe, maybe you have unconfessed sin in your life. Maybe God's trying to teach you something, Job. They're guessing at why Job is experiencing all this pain, and they're trying to determine why God is punishing Job because obviously he did something to deserve all this. And you've been there before when you've gone through pain and suffering. You say, why, God? Why am I going through this? Do I really deserve this? What are you trying to teach me through this? Did I do something wrong? Why did I get cancer? Why did my spouse have to go through that suffering? Why did my child die? I don't understand, God. Why? And you're grasping at reasons And sometimes we see, especially through the book of Job, we're reminded that sometimes we may never know the reason why. There's a mystery to our suffering because Job is totally blameless and upright, and yet he suffers. And through it all, God is totally sovereign and he's totally fair. Job is never given the answer of why. And through it all, Job trusted God. Through all of his suffering, he trusted God. He says, if I have to defend myself to you, God, to prove my innocence, to clear my name, even if you strike me down because I'm in your presence, then let me defend myself. But he has unwavering hope in God through it all. And so we come to this verse, though he slay me, yet will I trust him even if he drains my bank account, even if all my children are dead, even if he kills me, I'm gonna trust that he knows what he's doing. When you face overwhelming pain and suffering in your life, here's what you can do. You can follow the example of Job. First of all, release your grief, your pain, your suffering to God. You can worship God even through the pain. And then finally, you can trust God even when you don't understand. Job reminds us that you may never know the reason why, but you can still choose to trust him. Now, trusting him doesn't mean you'll never have questions. Job 
asked those questions, God, why? Jeremiah asked questions, why, God? Remember often David in the Psalms, where are you, God? How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Remember me? I'm going through pain here. I'm going through suffering. Do you remember me? I, like, where are you, God? And even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, God, Father, is there another way? Can't there be another way through this? Does it have to be the cross? And in the end, Job says, even though I don't have an answer, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And Jesus says, even though it's not the answer I want, not my will, but yours be done. Sometimes you can't make sense of your suffering. Sometimes it doesn't seem logical. The question is, will you blame God or will you praise him? Will you curse God or trust him even more? Will you hope in him even when things seem hopeless in your situation? Even though you lose everything, your fortune, your family, your wealth, your health. Now, do you remember the answer that God gives to Job for his suffering? Job wants to know why, and at the end, God finally speaks. And did you know this is the longest list of questions in the Bible? It's God asking questions in response to Job's questioning. Why? And chapters 38, you can turn there if you want, chapter 38 through 42, God gives 77 questions. In Hebrew, the, the, the number seven is the number of perfection, usually in Scripture. And so 77 would be like the perfect answer that God gives. And in verse three of chapter 38, God says, okay, brace yourself like a man, Job. It's time for me to ask you some questions. And here are some of the questions. Were you there, Job, when I laid the earth's foundations? Who was the one who came up with the, blue, blue, the blueprint for the universe, Job? Have you ever given orders to the morning? Do you send lightning bolts? Do they come to you and, and ask you to uh, report for duty? Can you count all the clouds, Job? Does the eagle soar at your command? Go ahead, Job. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. I'm God. Why don't you show me how you would run things if you were in charge? And Job's response finally is, okay, God, you're sovereign, and I'm not. You're all-knowing, and I'm not. You see the big picture even when I can't. And when I, you're going through these questions of why, perhaps you're never going to know, but Job teaches us to be satisfied by saying, God, you're in charge, and I'm not. I'm not going to understand, but I trust you. And in the end, Satan is silenced. Job's friends are silenced. Job is silenced. He says, I'm not worthy, and I'll, I'll just be quiet because I don't understand. I'm speaking of things that are beyond me. God, you see differently than I do. So sometimes the only answer that we can come up with is, God, I don't know, but I trust you. Last night I watched a, a bit of our Christmas Eve service. Uh, Christmas Eve at the six o'clock service, right over here, Kyle and Kim were leading a, uh, a devotional with their three children, talking about the promises of God. And in the script, out of Kyle's own mouth, he said, God's timing and plans are different than ours. Out of his own mouth, that's what he said. And isn't it so true? God's timing and God's plans are different than ours. Some of you have heard the name Horatio Spafford. 
is the man who wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. He was a lawyer and a church elder in Chicago. And during the Great Chicago Fire, most of his investments were burned up. Two years later, after the fire, his family planned a trip to Europe. His wife and daughters, four daughters, went ahead, and he was finishing up some business. And while they were crossing the Atlantic and um, their, their ship hit another ship, and 226 people died, including all four of his daughters. And his wife sent Spafford a telegram with two words, saved alone, meaning she was the only one of the family who survived. Spafford later traveled to visit with his grieving wife, and as he was passing the spot where all four of his daughters died, he penned the words, it is well with my soul. Whatever my lot, whatever you're putting me through, God, you've taught me to say, it is well with my soul. So I picked this song to close, and the, the refrain is going to be in our closing song, It Is Well With My Soul. It's interesting, I picked that song, at least for the first service, on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I was visiting with the Martin family, but then also with Cheryl. Cheryl, who, um, again, is not feeling anything below her neck. Pray for a miracle that she's able to walk again and use her arms again. And the thing that she loved to do, perhaps most of all, is sing. And so I uh, was praying with her, and I, I know she was able to feel, so I, I was just, I said, touched her toe. I said, can you feel that? She said, yeah. So I was just praying and rubbing her toe, you know, just rubbing her big toe. And I said, uh, you know, I know you love to sing, and and this is a difficult time. She can't, she can hardly breathe, let alone sing at this point. She can talk, but she gets out of breath. And so I said, I know it's important for you to uh, sing, but you can't do it right now, so I'll sing a song for you. And she wasn't too thrilled about that. <laughs> but, uh, but listen, this is what I asked her. I said, what's one of your favorite hymns? Take a guess what she said. It is well with my soul. And so I sang and came to the refrain, it is well. And as best she could do, she, she breathed out, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. I want to ask you, is it well with your soul today? Through all the grief you're going through, all the suffering you've experienced in your life, know that others have gone through it too. Jesus knows what you're going through. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. Is it well with your soul? As we're going to sing our closing song, I want to invite you, if you would like to come up and kneel at the altar, you can come up or you can sit in the front pew and pray or just wherever you're at right now. I want to invite you to take, a, take some time and pray that it would be well with your soul, that you, like Job, could say, though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. Though you're going through difficult times, it is well with your soul. Not my will, but your will be done, God. If you would like someone to pray for you, Bob and Chris Stahl would, were, are part of our prayer team this morning. Just so happens that we lined up our prayer team to start this Sunday, a time where we need a lot of prayer as a church. If you would like prayer, you can come over to the piano side and someone will pray with you. If you'd like to pray on your own or you know, not necessarily a member of the prayer team, you can come kneel over here. But let this be a time where you sing and pray.
And may it be well with your soul this morning.